Oh, okay. Now we're ready to begin. Allow me to present Dr. Jürgen Unitzer, who's an internationally recognized psychiatrist and health services researcher. His work focuses on innovative models of care that integrate mental health and general men medical services and on translating research on evidence-based mental health care into effective clinical and public health practice. He has over 200 scientific publications and is the recipient of numerous federal and foundation grants and awards for his research to improve the health and mental health of populations through patient-centered integrated mental health services. Uh, Dr. Unitzer trained in medicine at Vanderbilt, public policy at the University of Chicago, and public health and health services with an MPH at the University of Washington. He completed fellowships in geriatric psychiatry at UCLA and in primary care psychiatry at the University of Washington. He is professor and vice chair in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences uh, at our university, where he directs the Division of Integrated Care and Public Health. He directs the Ames Center dedicated to advancing integrated mental health solutions and the IMPACT program, which has trained more than 5,000 clinicians in over 600 primary care practices worldwide in an evidence-based program for depression treatment. Dr. Unitzer has served as Senior Scientific Advisor to the World Health Organization as, and as an advisor to the President's New Freedom Commission on Mental Health. He works with national and international organizations to improve behavioral health care for diverse populations. Dr. Unitzer. Thank you, uh, Sharon, for the nice introduction. Uh, hopefully I can live up to some of those nice things you just said about me. I'll uh, do my best. I'm not very good at technology, as you'll find out. Shortly, I can guarantee you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a topic called integrated behavioral health care. Uh, and before I get too far along that, I'll do a little bit of disclosure. Uh, I uh, am a researcher. I do uh, grant and contract funded research, uh, uh, mostly translational research uh, in the area of integrated behavioral health care. And uh, I want to acknowledge funding from uh, a number of federal and foundation funders. I have a contract with a local health plan, the Community Health Plan of Washington, uh, and with King County uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, I do some consulting uh, for nonprofit organizations. Uh, I don't do any funded work for pharmaceutical or device manufacturers. Uh, and I, uh, more importantly, want to thank and acknowledge my colleagues uh, here at the University of Washington who work in the AIMS Center and beyond the AIMS Center with me uh, probably most importantly, uh, in this topic that I'm going to talk about, I want to call out uh, the guy right here in the middle of the slide. That's Wayne Caton, uh, who was my mentor here. Uh, and much of what I have done that I'll present here actually builds on uh, some of the work he started. Uh, but uh, then going beyond that, lots of uh, great, fun colleagues uh, uh, that uh, work, with, uh, work with us here at UW. This is a really fun topic. It uh, hasn't always been a really fun or exciting topic, and I want to say a comment about that before we get started. I've been working in this area most of my professional life, uh, which is uh, just about 20 years. Uh, and uh, I remember about 15 years ago, uh, we held a really nice symposium at the American Psychiatric Association on the notion that a lot of behavioral health services actually don't happen. Uh, in mental health clinics, but they happen in primary care sites, and I think the title was something like Integrated Behavioral Health Services. Uh, and we had a really nice placement in the APA conference schedule, and it was a giant room, uh, and four people came. Uh, and uh, people had no interest in this whatsoever. And then a month later, okay, see, so here's the part where it's going to get scary because I'm going to screw up <laughs> the technology. Anyway, a month later, I gave a grand rounds at UCLA, which is where I was at the time, and I got booed because I talked about, there were a couple hundred psychiatrists in the audience and I talked about the fact that uh, maybe not, uh, you know, all mental health is provided by psychiatrists. And they're like, what are you doing? You're selling out, you know, the stuff that we do. 
Uh, and so we've come actually a long way. Uh, I put this up. This is a cover of the last year's uh, meeting program for the American Psychiatric Association annual meeting, and the theme of the meeting was integrated care. And there were 20-some sessions on integrated care that were packed, and so that's actually really nice uh, to see. This has all of a sudden become kind of a timely topic. I think it has in part to do with health care reform and a number of other things. But that's really nice uh, for those of us who work in this area, so we're not quite feeling like we're way out on the fringe uh, anymore. I'm a, a health services researcher. I'm going to say a word about what that is. Uh, I'm an applied health services researcher. These are the kinds of questions that I uh, think about. How well do we reach the patients who need help? Uh, how effective are our treatments when we do get patients uh, that we reach? Uh, and how do we close the gaps between what we already know, all of us in this room here know, how to do uh, good things for patients, uh, but there are big gaps between what we know and what we actually do. That's what I uh, sort of spend my time studying, uh, and I try to do that in two things. We try to think about can we come up with more effective models of care, uh, and if we have something that's effective, how do we take it out so a lot of people benefit from that? So it's really trying to make that public health impact. Um, a lot of my work has been in the area of depression. Uh, you all know about depression, I don't have to say much about that. I'll say a few very quick things. This is a common mental health problem. If you go into your typical primary care provider's waiting room uh, and you do a skid assessment on everybody who's sitting in that waiting room, you'll scare them all off, but uh, you'll also learn uh, that 10% of the people sitting in that waiting room on any given day are sitting there with uh, a major depressive disorder. Uh, and if you, can we, uh, put the down? yeah, we can try that if you can hear it. I'm like way up here. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, so, if you go to the waiting room in the adult medicine clinic uh, here at Harborview or the family medicine clinic, that's going to be closer to 20 or 25 percent because you're, you know, you're treating a really uh, disadvantaged population. Uh, if you go into the waiting room of a clinic that treats people with chronic medical disorders, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, or uh, serious pulmonary disease, uh, or especially uh, chronic neurological disorders, Parkinson's disease, uh, the rates of depression are going to be more in the 20, 30, 40 percent range. This is a very, very common problem, and it's also tremendously disabling. The World Health Organization now says this is the number two cause of disability worldwide, right after heart disease. Uh, that's really uh, striking, uh, and it's very expensive. Uh, and now we're living in an era where we're having to start increasingly to worry about uh, what all of the health care we all uh, provide and consume costs. Uh, and if you develop a major depressive disorder now on top of, say, your diabetes or whatever else problems you have, uh, that's going to increase your total health care costs over the, next, uh, over the next couple of years, 50 to 100 percent, and that's been shown in a whole bunch of studies. Uh, and ultimately, I think it's probably also the major driver, not the only driver, but a huge driver between the some 36,000 suicides that we have in this country uh, every year. This is not just a problem in the United States. This is global. Uh, I don't think there exists a place uh, where people don't get depressed and don't have really severe depressions. It is called different names in different places in different cultures, but the phenomenology is very, very robust. Uh, so we think there are about 20 million Americans who live with this problem uh, in any given day, and around the world that is probably closer to three or 400 million people, uh, and uh, it's a huge challenge. So how do we meet this challenge? Uh, this is data from <clears throat> the National Comorbidity Study. This is the big psychiatric epi study that is done to find out uh, community living Americans, uh, how many of them have depression, how many of them have anxiety. So they go out and they do really, really high quality sampling of lots and lots of people living in the community and they give structured diagnostic interviews to these folks and they get good estimates of rates of mental health problems in the United States. Uh, but on this particular one, which was done in around the year 2000, they also said to the folks who they did identify to meet a DSM criteria for a major mental health problem, did you ever have any care for this? Uh, specifically in the last 12 months, did you have any services uh, for this mental health problem? And here, here's what we learned. 59% of those living in the community with mental health problems said, I had no treatment whatsoever, nothing. 
41%, so four out of 10 said, I had some care for this mental health problem that you just diagnosed. And if they were asked where that care took place, 56% said I went to my primary care provider. Uh, that's where I saw the care. 44% said I saw a mental health professional. And the definition here of mental health professional was a very generous definition. So if you had had one or two sessions with a pastoral counselor, you were considered to have been treated by a mental health professional. So this was a very generous definition. And if you think about that, that means two out of 10, right? 44% of 41%. Uh, had any kind of treatment at all with a mental health uh, specialist. If they were asked specifically, uh, did you see a psychiatrist, it was 12%. So that means one out of 10 people living with a mental disorder uh, in this country see a psychiatrist. Now we're in the Department of Psychiatry, uh, and I'm gonna challenge uh, all of us to say, we may be pretty darn irrelevant to you know, the mental health problems in our country you know, in general. We're touching one out of 10 people uh, who have a diagnosed mental health problem. Uh, and, you know, we have 65 residents in our program, and if we triple the size of that program, uh, we're still not going to be touching a lot more people uh, anytime soon. So we have to think about, if we really want to make a difference in the public health, uh, we have to think about smart ways of leveraging the skill set of people in this room and get it out uh, and get it, you know, to help more people. That's basically the, the challenge I think we have uh, uh, that I'll talk about. Now let me show some data that's actually a lot closer to home. Uh, this is uh, data from the UW Medicine Healthcare System. These are billing diagnoses that patients walked away from UW Medicine uh, clinical uh, uh, programs in the year 2009. So uh, we looked at all the bills that we sent people uh, away with and looked at what was the diagnosis that was the code for the visit. And here is all the bills that were done that had mental health problem as the reason for the visit. And I'm gonna show you now the ones that are done in psychiatry. This is psychiatry here and psychiatry over at the University Hospital. Uh, all of our inpatient, all of our outpatient facilities. This is the number of clients, this is the number of visits. And this is uh, the number of ambulatory care provided by our colleagues in the primary care clinics in our system uh, where the patient walks out with the diagnosis of a mental health problem on the bill. So even here, we are a highly enriched environment for mental health specialists. We have, what Richard, 200 faculty. Uh, most of us are clinically active. Uh, and our colleagues in primary care are doing four visits for every visit that we do in primary care. Do that again. Is that skewed because our mental health clinic they hire you that says many patients? Yes. Patient yeah, patient. so uh, that's correct. So there are some visits that are happening uh, that are not billed uh, where I could have caught it on a claim. So it may be a little bit higher. But I think the, the truth is, uh, you know, most of the patients that are treated in our larger system that are getting care for mental health are actually getting it from a primary care provider, uh, not a mental health specialist. There's one more reason uh, why I think we need to think a little bit more about this notion of integrating our care a little bit better. And that has to do with, we talk a lot now about the concept of patient-centered care. So we're all mental health providers here. I'm trained as a psychiatrist. So when somebody gets sent to me, referred to me, my job is to figure out what is their mental health or substance abuse problem. That's what I do, right? And if you don't know what it is yet, you're gonna know it by the time you leave my office because that's what I do. I'm gonna, hopefully I don't induce it, uh, but I'll tag you with it. I'll tell you what it is, right? That's my job. Uh, and so that's all I think about, really. But my patients also have Parkinson's disease. They may have cancer. They may have diabetes. They have heart disease. They have a whole bunch of uh, sort of uh, behaviors uh, that are affecting uh, their, uh, their medical, their mental, and their physical health. And, and I always joke because I say our department's name is the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And I think if we were really honest, we'd lop off the behavioral sciences part because we actually know very little about what we do about these unhealthy behaviors. I think, uh, you know, a good PCP who's got a lot of experience is just about as good as helping someone change their health behaviors as most of us are. And I'm not saying that in a critical way. I just think it's a challenge to us. Uh, and then we have, and this is more recent, and we have folks here who work on this. I think we see a lot of patients, especially if you're going into primary care settings, who have really 
wicked mixtures of chronic emotional pain related to uh, mental health uh, diagnosable things and chronic physical pain. And the patient says, I feel terrible, I hurt all over. That's what they say to their primary care doctor when they come in. And it's very hard to tease out, and this is why I have a little picture in the corner here uh, of the chicken and an egg, you know. Uh, you know, uh, is it really mental? Is it really emotional? Is it really physical? And I think in other cultures, people don't uh, differentiate it nearly as neatly as we do. And I think there is some, and I'm not a brain researcher, you can tell that right away, uh, but there is actually some very sophisticated research being done now where people look at how the brain reacts to emotionally painful and physically painful stimuli and it doesn't look like it's all that different. Uh, so I think we sort it in our professions and in our billing and in all kinds of ways, but that's not who the patient is. The patient is all of these things. And so I think it really creates a challenge to us to say, can we provide a service that feels to the patient that they're really addressing really more than just, you know, I do my little thing. And of course, this is the one that's in the center because that's the most important thing in the world, right? We would all agree on that. So how do we help these folks? So. Here's how our healthcare system is organized. Uh, we, we build lots of cool treatment services. We're uh, the country in the world that has the most healthcare dollars spent on our patients. So we give people primary care and specialty medical care and we have mental health clinics and we have separate places that do alcohol and substance abuse treatment and we have social services and we have vocational rehabilitation services and we have a whole bunch of other interesting community-based services and I've drawn them all into these things. These are silos. I grew up on a farm, so I like these agricultural metaphors. Uh, and, uh, you know, the patients are going to all of these things, and the patients are saying sometimes to us things like, hey, this is the third or fourth or fifth place where I'm being asked about depression and sleep and energy. You know, don't you guys talk to each other? And of course, you know, why would we do that? You know, I'm in my thing, doing my thing, you know, it works for me. So I call that provider-centered care. It's sort of the opposite of patient-centered care. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, I showed this slide, and uh, our Secretary of Health was there, uh, our, sorry, our DSHS Secretary, and she got up and she said, in my office, these are not called silos. These are called cylinders of excellence. <laughs> Which I laughed, but then I thought, and I thought, okay, uh, she has a really, she has a point, because we are all working in one of those cylinders, and we do the best we can. We go to work every day, and we have to tell ourselves we're going to this beautiful place, and we're doing God's work there, and we love our patients, and we have a QI apparatus uh, that makes us do that job even better uh, every day, and, and that's all true, but the truth is it doesn't add up very much. It's a tremendous amount of dollars. Uh, and if you look at what happens uh, for the average patient who needs help across these different settings, and there's many, many of our patients like that, uh, it doesn't add up terribly well. A little bit back to some numbers. So let's say I'm a person who lives with depression. What's likely to happen to me? I have a major depression. I've lost my job. I'm thinking about a person that I saw uh, not that long ago. Uh, I have some family troubles, I have some financial troubles, I've developed a really severe depression, I'm drinking too much. Uh, you know, I have a perfectly treatable problem. Uh, it, now what's likely to happen? A 10% chance I'll see a psychiatrist in any given year. Four out of 10 chance, 40% chance, I'll go and have an encounter in a primary care clinic uh, where somebody will try to treat my depression. And in fact, 30 million times a year nowadays, uh, a patient walks out of a primary care doctor's office with a prescription for an antidepressant medication. That's a huge change from when I got started in this business, you know, 10, 15, uh, 20 years ago. People in primary care weren't treating depression all that much. Now there's lots of treatment, but if you look at the numbers, really, if you carefully follow those people, those 30 million people, one out of five looks a lot better a year later. And now you're going to say maybe if they had all gone to see a psychiatrist, they'd all be better. But I'm going to share some data with you in a little bit that's going to suggest we're not that much better. Uh, this, I don't know if you can read this caption. This says, of course you feel great. These things are loaded with antidepressants. Uh, so that's kind of the world, I think, we live in uh, right now. And that stuff's not cheap. Uh, here is our uh, colleague's perspective in primary care. Uh, there was a very big survey done. Um, a couple years ago where they asked a couple thousand primary care providers about their satisfaction with access to mental health services or any other kind of specialty health services for their clients. And mental health was at the rock bottom of this survey. Two thirds of these primary care providers said, for me to get help from a mental health provider 
that's good help for one of my patients, two-thirds of them said it's lousy. It's just terrible. It's a huge problem for me. Uh, worse than any other medical specialty they needed help with. And so this one, I don't know if you can read this. It couldn't get a psychiatrist, but perhaps you'd like to talk about your skin. Dr. Perry here is a dermatologist. <laughs> so maybe he can give the guy a Botox injection. I don't know if that'll get him off the ledge. Uh, and I'm making this a little bit like a joke, but I spent some time in one of our primary care clinics in our neighborhood clinics, and we were starting, and I'll talk about it at the very end of my presentation, a nice program now where we're actually integrating behavioral health services into these clinics. And a couple of them have the ability in the primary care clinic now to do Botox for you. Uh, and I thought it's interesting that Botox is there, we're not there. So maybe it is more important to make sure they look pretty uh, than uh, they feel good. All right, I'm gonna say a couple things about uh, what we know about the treatments uh, for uh, depression. And I'm gonna uh, show you some very high level summary data. Uh, this is, so what do we do with depression? We can give a pill for it or we can talk to people, right? We can do psychotherapy, we can also do ECT and TMS, but sort of the really common treatments Medications, uh, and there are some 29 FDA-approved antidepressant medications now, so we've got lots of choices. Uh, and this is a, a, a meta-analysis that Michael Thais published a couple years ago, where he took all of the clinical trials that have been done with antidepressant medications, and he said, you know, the common outcome criteria in that research is either response, which is usually defined as somebody has a 50% or greater reduction in their symptoms from where they started, or complete remission, which is they essentially totally symptom-free. That's where we'd all like to go. And if you take all of the uh, clinical trials with the antidepressants together, 63% of the people in these trials have a response. That's pretty darn good. 47% complete remission. That's pretty nice. Uh, so now, uh, uh, in the last couple of years, there have been a couple of nice papers published with pretty good sample sizes, sample sizes in the thousands, so not teeny little sample sizes, where we say, how well does this actually work in private practice? So this is data from uh, almost 20 private practice psychiatrists, uh, commercially insured patients, self-paid patients, not poor patients, uh, where they systematically followed everybody who started treatment uh, for depression. Uh, and if you look at them, 36% met the response criteria and 18% met the remission criteria. This is data from John Rush uh, in Texas, uh, the Texas Medication Algorithm Project, where they tracked mental health specialists treating uh, public sector outpatients. So this would be more like the kinds of clinic you'd have here at Harborview. 26% responders, 11% remitters. Uh, this is data from my work that uh, I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, this is what we see in primary care. This is from a study that had 18 clinics in five states, over 1,000 patients. Uh, and when we looked at it, most of the patients were getting prescriptions for antidepressant medication. Some of them were being referred to mental health specialists. And a year later, 19% had been good responders. 9% met the criteria for remission. So this is all, in general, not overwhelming, right? There is this huge voltage drop from what could happen and what actually does happen if you really sort of carefully look at what happens. Uh, and I am about figuring out what do we do with this voltage drop? What can we do here? Now, some of it is explained uh, by the kind of people we're talking about. So the folks who go into a clinical trial uh, over in Bellevue in a, in a strip mall somewhere uh, and get treatment for free and have no other problems, they can't be pregnant, they can't be sick, you know, uh, they can't be too old, they can't be too young, they're probably a little bit different. Uh, but I think some of it is just, you know, we don't provide, you know, care that's really all that effective. Now, I'm going to say something about psychotherapy before I move on because when I have shown this med data before, people said, see, that's it. Medications don't work, right? Uh, it's actually very interesting. Uh, the psychotherapy data is not all that different. So there's lots and lots of very good manualized psychotherapies uh, for depression. Uh, and uh, this was a nice study a couple years ago uh, uh, where they looked at uh, not a real meta-analysis, but they said on average... Uh, clinical trials uh, for things like major depression, if you look at them, uh, people get about 12.7 sessions on average of whatever the treatment is, CBT, IPT, you know, whatever your treatment is. Uh, and about 55 to 60 percent are significantly improved. That's pretty good. Actually, it's not all that different, right, from what we saw with the meds. And then they looked at uh, as much as they could, uh, how well does this stuff work in the real world? So this is interesting. Uh, this is data from a couple of projects that I've worked on. Uh, up to 50% of the people who were referred for psychotherapy by a primary care provider never show up even for one visit. 
they just don't go. So you, you lost half your people right there. Uh, if you look at people who do go to psychotherapy, 30% of people stop after one session. So they got a one-shot psychotherapy, right? So that, uh, you know, is a real challenge. There's only one person that I know that can do that, and that's Dr. Phil on TV. <laughs> but he's not on our faculty. We would like to recruit him. But uh, he's not, none of us in this room are that good. So we really can't heal people with a major depression in one session. But that's what we would have to do if that's all we get. Now, I think that also tells us that whatever we're providing, it may be nice for us, but a third of our patients don't find it attractive enough to come back for a second visit. So there is a challenge to us, I think. If you look at the number of people that folks who go on, actually, the number of sessions they get, it's three to five. This is data from Group Health. This is data actually from our own system. Uh, and this is data that's been shown in lots of other systems. That's the typical number of sessions a person gets. Uh, now, even there, there is no manualized treatments for major depression that I know of that have a lot of track record with three to five sessions. So that's the challenge, right? We have this huge voltage drop in general between the stuff that we know we could do and what we actually uh, do do. And in this paper, what they did is they tracked a couple of very large samples, uh, college students who were getting psychotherapy, a couple of other samples, and they found out that 15 to 20 percent met the improvement criteria and 5 to 10 percent who were getting psychotherapy were completely recovered. So it's actually not all that different from what we saw uh, with the med data. So that's the challenge. So how do we close this gap? There's two things I think about. The first one is I say we got a lot of neat treatments, but we don't package them very well. We deliver them in ways that just don't seem to get the same effect that they can get in uh, efficacy research. So we need robust models of care that make sure that uh, the patient actually sees treatment that really is more effective. And once we have them, we have to get these models out because we can't keep saying one out of ten people can get it if they can come to see a psychiatrist. Uh, that's just not going to ever reach very many people. So we have to find ways of getting this stuff out. And I'll talk a little bit about both of those things. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, so how do we make models of care that do that in a more effective way? Uh, I think the single uh, strongest, uh, most uh, powerful piece of um, evidence we have in that area is the concept of collaborative care. This is work that uh, Wayne Caton and colleagues here at UW started uh, in the, in the uh, early 90s and in 1995, the first big publication of the, process, uh, the, the principle of collaborative care, where if you take uh, a mental health provider and you, you put them into a primary care clinic and that mental health provider works closely with their primary care colleague treating the patient's depression, you can get a much better outcome than if you let that primary care colleague on their own or if you say to them, you know, refer me a patient if you think you need help. Um, since that original study, there have now been 70 randomized controlled trials that basically find exactly the same thing. There was a nice meta-analysis in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2006 that said there are now 37 RCTs on this. Uh, and uh, just this year, the CDC commissioned a meta-analysis. Now there is 69, actually it's more than that, it's now over 70 uh, randomized controlled trials. They all say the same thing. This works better. This kind of collaborative care works much better than traditional uh, co uh, referral out care. And then there's a whole bunch of folks here, Peter. Uh, Roy and Doug Zatzik, who have taken some of these very same principles and applied them not only in people with uh, depression, but in people with uh, anxiety disorder, uh, people who are seen in a trauma center who have PTSD. Those principles hold up quite nicely. Uh, this is one of the largest one of these trials. Uh, actually, I think it's the largest published trial. It's the IMPACT trial. This is a trial I, I had the pleasure to lead. Uh, and I'll use this picture to sort of explain a little bit about what it is that we do. Uh, in that kind of an approach. So we say a lot of these folks don't come to a mental health specialist. They show up in primary care. And what do we have to do to help the primary care provider who sees that person who's really depressed or really anxious to do a better job? So uh, we did this study where in 18 primary care clinics in five states, uh, we trained a person in the primary care uh, provider's office in the role of a mental health care manager. And I'll explain what that is. Uh, what the doctor would do is recognize the patient is depressed. Uh, find the care manager, introduce the patient to the care manager, and the care manager is trained to do a couple of things. They spend more time than the doctor has in a short visit explaining to the patient what depression is, how it affects their life, what it is they can do. If the doctor prescribed the medication, they'll work with that uh, patient to make sure the patient actually takes the medication because one of the things we found is a third of the time the patient leaves the office, they never even take the medication. You know, the job of this person is to call out 
within a couple of days and say, how'd it go with your medication? And then if it's the patient says, look, I took that home and my wife said, you know, Prozac, you know, are you crazy? There's a guy down the street who shot up a post office after getting on this stuff. Don't get started with it. You know, you know if that patient never comes back to the doctor, you lost a third of the people right there. Uh, so there's some very low tech things that a person like this can do. Uh, we also taught these care managers a couple of brief behavioral uh, techniques. We teach them motivational interviewing. We teach them uh, behavioral activation, which is a very rigorous uh, but a pretty easy to use uh, protocol. That's sort of like the, the B part of CBT in a sense. Uh, and, uh, and they do that uh, alongside with the doctor using a medication. They might see the patient for six, eight, ten sessions. They might do some of that work on the telephone because you can do that on the telephone as well. Uh, and really keep the patient engaged. Make sure they get a good course of treatment. The other thing we teach these care managers to do every single time they see a client, we say measure how bad the depression is. So they give a, a simple depression rating scale, a PHQ-9, every single time they see the patient. If the patient says, I feel better, but the numbers are still saying, this guy doesn't eat, he doesn't sleep, we know we have to make a change. And that's a huge change from how we practice, actually even in psychiatry. What I see the folks in our clinic do is they make a really good diagnosis. Uh, you know, and the note says, you know, they met eight out of the nine DSM criteria for major depression. And then the next time the patient comes back, uh, and what do we do? We say, how are you feeling now? And you're a nice doc or a nice psychologist, and the patient is a nice patient, and they like you, and they smile at you, and they say, I'm a little bit better. You say, great, let's do another session. Or, you know, keep, keep going on your medicine. Uh, and that goes on session after session, but we don't really know how much better are they. So I do a lot of work in primary care, and my primary care colleagues at some point started teasing me because they said, what if I treated your blood pressure this way? I would diagnose you with hypertension, and you would come back to my clinic, uh, four weeks later, and uh, I would say to you, how do you feel about your blood pressure now? And you know, you're a nice guy, and I'm a nice guy, and you would say, I think it's a little bit better. And I'd say, great, keep taking that, you know, whatever your entry-level blood pressure medicine was. And if we treated it that way, 20% of people's hypertension would be under control. That's exactly where we are with depression. And that's what happens in primary care. These people get on meds, low doses of an SSRI, and this interaction goes on, and then it goes on for a whole year. Uh, and in the IMPACT trial, we followed a 1,000 patients in these clinics in our usual care control group, and that's exactly what was happening. The, everyone who got on antidepressant medications, 25% got referred out for psychotherapy. In the psychotherapy, the same thing. Uh, you know, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling okay. Let's do another session. But there were lots and lots of people who were getting treatment but not responding. So the other thing we do in this approach is we say, Every patient who gets started in treatment gets put in a computerized registry. It's basically a list, a tracking tool, and that care manager has to look every week. Uh, are my patients coming in? Are they getting better? And if they're not coming in, it's the job of that care manager to bring that patient back in because we are all very good at helping the people who show up for treatment, but we don't remember the people who didn't show up for treatment, right? They're out of sight, out of mind, and our denominator is really not the right denominator. Our denominator should be everybody who ever came for us to, help, to, to us for help. So this tool, this registry tool does that. And then what we did is we said, well, do you need a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a mental health expert? Yes, you do. And the way we used uh, a psychiatrist in this project is we said every week that psychiatrist has to come into the clinic or get on the phone with that care manager and talk over every single patient who's followed in that clinic whose depression score is not improving. They have to make a recommendation about what's next. And what we learned is, and we also learned this from STAR-D, uh, you know, any one treatment will only get about 30 or 40 percent of people better. And this is true for psychotherapy, this is true for medication, so we should have systems that can change your treatment three, four, five times. And if you do that, eventually you get a much larger number of people better. But we're not well set up to make sure that we make these treatment changes. So that's basically what we tested. And the psychiatrist saw about 10% of the patients in person because it might be the third time I'm hearing about a case and I just don't know what that is. So I say, look, I don't know. I need to really see this person. And then I might change my recommendation. So that was the trial. I'm going to go really fast, show a little bit of data. So we did this in eight healthcare organizations. In every one of those organizations, uh, 200 patients were in the study. They all had major depression. Uh, and a hundred of them got a usual care control group. And basically what that was is we said to the doctors and to the patients, do anything you can uh, to help this person with their depression. And what usually happened is doctor pulled out a prescription pad uh, for an antidepressant medication or might have referred to a mental health specialist. In the other half, 
got this more integrated model where we had the care manager tracking the patient closely. We did a lot of measurement, and whenever the measurement told us the patient wasn't doing better, one of our psychiatrists had to make a recommendation about how we're going to change things. Um, so if you look at this, if you draw a bar through our usual care control group, a year out, 19% on average of these patients had significant improvements in their depression. If you added the collaborative care, the measurement-based services, you could more than double that. And that we saw in every single place where we tried that. So this was a very, very robust effect. Uh, we also looked at health care costs. I'm just going to sort of tell you the highlight here. This was a very expensive group of patients. It turned out over four years that we followed this group, uh, these 1,800 patients, on average, they used $31,000 in health care costs. It cost us about $522 to provide these services in the primary care clinic, but every other single category of health care costs we followed over the next couple of years, we saw reductions in costs. So at the end of the day, we spent $522 on these integrated services, and we saved about $3,300 in total health care costs. So from a return on investment perspective, that's how business people think about this. It's a dollar spent and six and a half dollars saved in terms of total health care costs. This is what uh, CMS calls the triple aim, uh, getting better patient outcomes, uh, more satisfied patients, and actually saving money along the way. We didn't know that word back then, but that's actually sort of the, the current term for it. And so what we learned from this project is if you do this well, you can get much better mental health outcomes. We also, and I didn't show you the data on this, we found patients had less physical pain, they functioned better, they had better quality of life, their providers and the patients were more satisfied with this care, and it was more cost effective. That is essentially what uh, our healthcare system, what healthcare reform is after right now. You know, can we get better uh, access, uh, more satisfied patients, better clinical outcomes, and still reduce healthcare costs? So I think this is a very nice example of that. Now, we're researchers, so when a researcher does something that works well, they do a lot more of it. You get more grants, you get more papers, and so there have now been nine replication studies of this very exact same model. Uh, these are randomized controlled trials, and it's been tried. Wayne Caton did this right after we finished IMPACT with a group of depressed diabetics at Group Health. Uh, it's been done with cancer patients with depression. It's been done with adolescent depression. It's been done with patients. This is a large study just published last year. Patients who have coronary uh, events, so MIs, and get depressed afterwards, if you give them this kind of an intervention, you not only improve their depression, you also uh, reduce their re-events, uh, and they actually had lower cardiac mortality in this study. Karina Davidson just published this last year. So that's really neat for those of us who do research because it gets us tenured and it gets us you know, more grants. Uh, but it's actually not so neat for the people who need this help because these papers don't get people better. So that's what I'm going to uh, try to wrap up with. So what are we really doing when we do this? So we go into a primary care setting. We say you have a primary care physician. You have a patient. Some of these clinics might have other behavioral health staff. And we're adding two roles. We're adding this behavioral health care manager role, and we're adding a consulting psychiatrist. Uh, and when you do this in a very systematic way, you can really enhance a, a primary care clinic to take care of a lot of pretty sick people. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to say a word now because we're here at Harborview and uh, many of our patients are not in primary care. We take care of a lot of really sick, severely, chronically, persistently, severely uh, mentally ill patients. And I'm going to try to make an argument that some of the very same ideas were also relevant for that population. Uh, so what about this idea of collaborative care for patients who have severe mental illnesses? We do know a lot about them. Uh, we know that they have very high rates of physical illness. So people who live with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder have much higher rates of uh, medical illnesses. They have high rates of risk behaviors. 95% of these folks smoke. That's mind-boggling, right? That's as compared to 20% in the U.S. population. 95%. So, in fact, uh, I was at a clinic the other day, and they said, should we screen for smoking? I said, you don't need to screen for smoking. You should screen for the occasional person who doesn't smoke and see what's wrong with them, <laughs> right? I mean, it's really amazing if you think about that. Uh, huge rates of obesity uh, and uh, very poor medical care for these folks. I think Barry has some sense of that. He's taken care of a lot of these folks over the years. It's not easy to give them good medical care, so I'm not saying this to blame anybody. It's a huge challenge for us high expenses, and actually the big expenses to Medicaid from the SMI populations are not necessarily their mental health treatments. It's tons of medical costs, because these folks have 
you know, uh, a very expensive uh, medical uh, uh, costs and, and a huge amount of premature mortality. This is a little data on the mortality rates of people living with mental disorders compared to the population. Every single disorder that's been studied has a two times, you know, almost double the mortality rate. It's not uncommon. Uh, so our, our patients in our mental health centers are not dying from suicides. They're dying from strokes in their 50s. Uh, you know, I'm going to have hopefully my stroke when I'm in my 70s or 80s. Uh, I have hypertension, so, uh, but I've had that managed since I'm 30 years old. Uh, but uh, I think there are too many psychiatrists who've had to go to funerals of their patients, you know, in their 50s and 60s, and they're not dying because of a suicide. They're dying because, uh, because of this. Uh, this is data from the Katy study. This was, remember, the big Katy trial where they tried different antipsychotic medications for people with uh, mental illness, uh, with schizophrenia, and this is what they learned. 30% of the diabetics in Katy had no treatment whatsoever. 60% of the hypertensives in Katy had no treatment. 88% uh, of the people who had high lipids in Katy had no treatment, no treatment at all. Uh, of the people who did treatment, about half of them don't have effective treatment. You know, if you think about that, if you're working in a mental health center, you might be the only medical guy in that center. How comfortable are we with this, right? You know, I am waiting for the day where somebody, some NAMI, somebody will come with a big lawsuit and say, you've taken care of my child or of my loved one for the last 30 years, and you knew they had hypertension, you knew this, and nothing happened, and now it's 50 or 50 years old, they've had a stroke. You know, so we have a lot of people say, well, but wait, I'm not comfortable with that. You know, I'm a mental guy. Uh, but we all went to medical school, those of us who are psychiatrists, and I think we really need to think about what can we do. This is the reverse of what I've been talking about. What can we do to get these folks, you know, better medical care? This is easy to say and very hard to do. Uh, so this is a slide I got from a friend of mine, uh, and I was complaining about when we show these kind of provocative findings. Everybody says, yes, that's true. We need to do better. And if everybody around me changes what they do, It'll work out just fine. So, you know, <laughs> just like it's hard for a, a patient to change their health behaviors, it's very hard for providers to change their behavior. And organized groups of providers are even more challenged to try to change what they do. We like to be provider-centered. It works for us. Uh, this is a slide from a friend of mine uh, who runs a community mental health center in Colorado. And when they went to a new building, she said, I'm going to create a floor plan that forces all the mental health providers and all of the medical providers to work together. This is a, a beautiful facility, brand new facility, and they literally share everything. They share the exam rooms, you know, they interact with each other all of the time. Uh, this is one way to try to go there, but they still have to learn how to work well together. So physical integration is just a good start. Uh, but it's a challenge to us, and I don't think we do terribly well. I think we do maybe a little bit better here at Harborview with this, but I bet we could do a lot better. Okay, I'm going to skip this too. I'm going to uh, say a couple more things about this notion of, now let's say we find something that works. Let's say you guys here at Harborview come up with a fabulous, truly integrated, really excellent approach to trying to care for these folks, and you're managing their hypertension and their lipids and their diabetes and their schizophrenia. Uh, and now... You've done this here, but what about the guys over at Novels? What about the guys at Sound Health? What about, you know, how do you take something that works once you've figured it out and really get it out there? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So there's a lot of talk nowadays about this notion of translational research. We all are supposed to be doing translational research, right? And people have different ideas. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the, the buzzword is the NIH uh, and our medical school would like to do us to do work that goes from bench to bedside, right? And I think mostly what we researchers do, we go from bench to bookshelf. You know, people like me, we do a study like that, we get it published in JAMA or in the New England Journal or in the British Medical Journal, we're like, great, we're done, we're going on to the next study, right? Works for us, gets us our next grant but it's not going to help a person. Uh, and I complained about this to a buddy of mine uh, when I was finishing the big impact trial, and this was when I was still in L.A., uh, and I said, you know, we published this, and the first week that it was out, I got 100 phone calls on my answering machine. This was at the days where people were still using answering machines. Uh, and, you know, they weren't from researchers saying, what a great thing, tell me about this. They were from families and patients who said, hey, I read about this in the L.A. Times. When can I show up for the care? I'm like, wait a minute, I, I'm a researcher, you know, I don't really, 
you know, actually provide this care. Uh, and I started going out and working with organizations to say, hey, look, look at this, try to implement this. And it turns out it's very challenging to change practices. And uh, somebody sent me this quote. I'll let you read it because uh, it helped me a lot when I was really struggling with this. I realized it's harder to do this dissemination work than to do, you know, uh, even a very complex multi-site research trial. So I feel like what I've done the last 10 years of my work is mostly what's underlined here, which is to work out this irrigation system. How do you actually help people uh, make that kind of practice change? And we've done a lot of that. I think Sharon mentioned that at the beginning. We have trained about 5,000 providers in over 600 primary care clinics around the country in some foreign countries, uh, actually implementing this impact model. And I actually have data on how well it works, and I'll show you a little bit of that. Uh, so we've a lot of experience with working out this irrigation system, and it's been a very humbling experience. Practice change is even harder than individual health behavior change, because what you're talking about is groups of people having to change the way they work together, payers having to change things. Very, very hard. So these are quotes I get from medical directors of clinics that I try to persuade to implement these kinds of integrated models. They say, this is much harder. We thought you were going to come and tell us, you know, don't use the blue pill anymore, use the purple pill. That's the easy practice change, right? Uh, but you're telling us you need to have a person here. We need to work more closely. We need to do all this measurement-based care. Not a lot of our patients get better. We need to be better prepared to make changes in treatment. Wow, that's a lot of practice change. And they say, even if we like that, uh, one of the guys I talked to uh, said, look, I'm running my primary care practice full speed. You know, we do 100,000 patient visits a year. We are running all the time, and I can't remodel it while I'm running this practice, he said, it feels like you're asking me to change the oil while I'm driving the car. And that was sort of interesting. Oops, see, screwing it up. Uh, this is another one I got from a guy. Uh, we're in an airplane town here, right? So uh, he said, it feels like you're asking me to rebuild the airplane in midair. You know, he said, I'm flying my clinic. This is my clinic, right? This is some old DC something. I don't know what it is. Uh, he said, that's my primary care clinic now. You want me to fly this? That's the new 787 that finally did fly. A uh, 17 year lag between you know when they figured out the concept and when it came about, so not all that different from what we do in research. But anyway, he said, I need to put this down on the ground, take it apart, send everybody home for a while, hire a few new people, retrain everybody, and then we can fly again. But that's not how it works, right? Because you have to do these changes in mid-air. That's what's really hard about this implementation work. So we've learned a few things about that. We have developed some very nice systematic approaches, tools that help clinics figure out where am I right now, where do I want to go, how do I move my way there. We've built a very nice, we call it a, a three-step team building process. We have done a lot of this implementation with some very large healthcare systems, and I'll talk about one example in a minute. We've done this with 130 clinics here in the state of Washington, with about 90 clinics in Minnesota. Uh, we're doing it right now with 110 clinics that are part of LA County Department of Mental Health. And we're about to start a big project with New York Medicaid where we're going to put these models into 28 hospital-based primary care clinic systems. Uh, and uh, the project here in Washington, uh, just to wrap up, I'll tell you a little bit about that. So we took this idea uh, and we worked with a Community Health Plan of Washington, which is a health plan here that's a nonprofit health plan uh, that uh, uh, does manage Medicaid. And uh, we trained... Uh, people in 130-some clinics here in the state of Washington. You see a lot of them here in King County, 29 in here in King County, including three of the clinics here at Harborview. I don't know if there's anybody here who works on the MHIP program. Yeah, very good. Uh, so you guys have been doing this for a couple of years. This is the basic model that you're doing. Uh, and we have now served over 25,000 clients uh, with five FTE consulting psychiatrists. So that's a really powerful way to leverage uh, a small number of specialists to reach a lot of people in a lot of places. So you can take these ideas to scale. We've used a web-based registry tool that sits behind that that helps us keep track of all of these patients. Uh, and we can track how our patients are doing. Uh, we also can track what they have. So the 25,000 patients, most of them have some form of depression, lots of anxiety disorders, lots of PTSD. 17% of these folks have PTSD, alcohol, substance abuse. I put a little asterisk here because this number actually is the people where the primary reason they're in the program is for that. If you look at the comorbidity, it'd be much closer to 50%. Uh, bipolar disorder, this was a huge surprise to us. 15% of these folks that we're managing in these primary care clinics actually had bipolar disorder. We sort of used to think that's where specialty care stops. It's actually all happening. But that's actually not true. 
There are 3,000 uh, bipolars uh, that are uh, in the mental health specialty setting in this program, uh, and uh, most of them are actually in the primary care clinics. And 45% of the folks we're treating in this program, when they come to the program, they have thoughts of suicide. So this is not the worried well. These are some pretty sick people. When we log on, as our consulting psychiatrists do, uh, to our registry tool, what we see is we see uh, the whole caseload of patients, and it shows me a number, a small number of people who are not doing well in terms of their depression scores. That tool organizes how I spend my time. So I have to consult on all those people who are not doing well. That's the difference between me just showing up and say, talk to me about whoever you want to talk to me about. And I have the responsibility to make a little note, short little note, uh, to the doctor that says, I reviewed your case, I've talked with the care manager, uh, and here is my recommendation. And if I can't make a good recommendation, then I have to go see the patient and see, can I do that then? Uh, this is an example of one of our uh, clinic systems here in town. This is not Harborview, this is uh, neighbor care. Uh, one of our FQHCs here in town, they have 6,000 clients, uh, uh, sorry, they have uh, 2,000 clients active in this program, six of their clinics. Uh, so this is the Pike Market Clinic and the 45th Street Clinic and clinics like that. Uh, pretty tough to treat patients and we can track their depression scores. We can see that we can follow 80 to 90 percent of these folks for up to six months. So uh, these care managers can really engage these people. These are hard people to engage. Uh, you can see about seven or eight contacts with the care manager on average. Most of these patients have had their care reviewed by one of our psychiatrists. And if you look at the outcomes, not that bad. These are the uh, people who meet that uh, significant clinical improvement criteria, not all that different from our actual research. Uh, when we started this project with this set of clinics, these numbers were in the 15 to 20 percent range, and now we have them up almost double. So you can make that happen with some very complex real-world population. When we started this program, we tracked a bunch of people in these clinics with depression, and it took, uh, for half the people that we tracked, it took about 65 weeks for the typical depressed person to get better. After we made a bunch of uh, quality improvements, uh, uh, we could actually get that time until depression improved down to about 24 weeks. It's a huge reduction in the time that people had to live with this problem. We also have a subset of these patients. This is almost 1,000 high-risk moms who are in the program. Well, we did exactly the same thing. Before we made all of these quality improvements, it took about 60 weeks uh, for your typical patient's depression to get better, and we were able to move that all the way down to about 14 weeks. A huge change. And what's the difference? It's still the same clinics, it's still the same providers, but we're making these measurements, we're making a lot more active treatment changes. If they're in whatever treatment it is, it's not helping, we're saying that's not good enough, we need to make a change. And if you're that active and you keep changing the treatment, you can actually get these treatments that we all know how to use to work pretty well. So. Let me wrap up with a couple comments on what does this mean for those of us who are psychiatrists. I think this is a new role. This is a different way for a psychiatrist to work. And for some of us, this is a challenge. Uh, so we have five uh, FTE. These are our faculty, uh, and some of them are here in the room. And uh, five FTE psychiatrists being able to advise uh, hundreds of primary care doctors on 25,000 patients. Last year, we did 10,000 of these psychiatric case reviews making recommendations to the primary care providers all over uh, the state. And I don't think of these as full-on psychiatric assessment. I think of these as little nudges. You know, I think of them, you know, you hear about something and you say, how about this, try this. That might not be right on, but two or three weeks later, if that person is still sick, you're going to hear about the patient again, and you've got more than one shot. Uh, in a traditional model, you send me a patient, I'll see your patient, I do the best I can, I make a great formulation, I send you a long report back with a recommendation, 50% chance it's maybe not the right recommendation. With this model, I have a lot of little shots and people don't fall through the cracks. And eventually, I might be able to get it right. Uh, so what you can do uh, in this kind of a, a, a role, you can take care of a very large population of patients rather than a fairly uh, small number of people. Very different way of working. This could be very relevant once you get outside of uh, the United States, and we have started to do some interesting work uh, in the area of global mental health. This is a map. This is my friend Shekhar Saxena, who is the head of mental health for the WHO, and he's done some very nice projections about mental health workforce uh, around the world. Uh, this is the number of psychiatrists per 100,000 population. You can see where are the psychiatrists. They're in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, they're in, Spain, uh, in France, and they're in Russia. 
everywhere else there just aren't any psychiatrists. Uh, so all of the treatments that we develop for specialists aren't relevant in large parts of the world. Uh, there, in fact, are more psychiatrists in San Francisco, which has 800,000 people, than the entire continent of Africa, which is over 1 billion people. So if we want to help somebody outside of where we are right here, where we even don't do a great job, we need to think about different ways of trying to reach people uh, with our interventions. I think I'm going to uh, wrap up on this just to say uh, uh, I showed some things that are pretty far away. Uh, we have a couple of fun new projects that are just starting up. Uh, we got one of those big uh, um, Medicare innovation grants. This is an $18 million project uh, where we're going to take these ideas, working with uh, ICSI, which is a, an organization in Minnesota that does systematic quality improvement, and we're going to take this idea and try it with 8,000 patients in seven healthcare systems with the primary goal of showing Medicare that you can actually save money if you provide better uh, mental health treatments. Uh, so that's the primary outcome, actually. And we also have a new grant. This is also a federal grant. It's a $12 million grant uh, from an organization called the Social Innovation Fund, uh, where we're going to uh, work with very rural and frontier clinics in the Whammy region to try to take these treatments out to those clinics and see can we support them uh, using telehealth closer to home. And some of you are working in this. This fall, we're actually putting this model of care into five of our UW neighborhood clinics. Uh, and I'm very excited about this. Uh, we're going to have uh, this kind of integrated services with a care manager and one of our faculty uh, practicing there as a psychiatrist at the Northgate Clinic, the Ravenna Clinic, Belltown, Kent Des Moines and Shoreline. We're already doing it at a couple clinics here at Harborview, and we're also starting it at the Medicine Clinic uh, at Roosevelt. I think I used up almost, uh, I used up all my time. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. You know, I'm not, <laughs> uh, questions, I'm here, so I think you can figure out how to find me. I'd love to talk to any of you about this stuff. Uh, so, sure thank you very much. Thank you for coordinating the questions. I will say, Eileen Whalen, the executive director of the hospital, who a couple of years ago started working with us in our UW Medicine behavioral strategic planning said we should got introduced. If this is so good, how come we're not doing it in UW Medicine? <laughs> so we are now doing it in UW Medicine and it's going to be fast. Questions for Dr. Newman? Okay. Okay. Hey, uh, thoughts, go. questions? You're going to this one from us. Yes. Thank you. You talk very uh, persuasively about the biological and the psychological. Is there room in all this? The social? Yes. Do people see uh, relatives, is there any kind of time and awareness of what they do around the patient? Yeah, what about the social? Great question. Uh, and in our Washington State uh, Mental Health Integration Program, most of the clinicians who work in the care manager are all social workers. They are very, very well aware of a uh, huge social component to, to all of this physical and emotional suffering. Uh, and they, uh, they do a nice job addressing it. I went very fast because I got short on time in the end. Uh, we did some really neat work uh, with uh, a group in uh, New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, and most of, there weren't any mental health workers or health workers left for that matter. So we trained a whole bunch of family members and lay health workers uh, to try to help, you know, address some of those needs. And I think we learned a lot from that. I think there are lots of interesting opportunities to start saying, how do we take it and we build in, uh, you know, folks who can help with that stuff more. Very, very good point. Other questions? Yes? How many, if you thought about the way you get that huge placebo effect from seeing somebody, you know, having somebody care about you, calling, doing all that. <clears throat> How much is that going to separate from drug? It's probably not going to separate from drug by very much because this, you're going to get a huge placebo effect. <clears throat> yeah. So the yield is not going to be looked at. Well, if I could bottle what goes into the placebo control arm of a very well done clinical trial and give it to everybody in the country who is depressed, I'd be in really good shape. Because if you think about it, what do we do with these folks? We say you need to come in every week. You need to learn about your symptoms. We're going to do a symptom rating for you every week. Uh, we're going to give you good care with a nice looking person for free. Uh, you know, you're going to have to take off every Friday afternoon from whatever, you know, you're in a job that you're not happy with right now. Uh, come in and have what's well, a pretty pleasant experience. Yeah, that's going to have a very powerful effect. Uh, so I think there is a, a lot to that. And actually, one of the things that got me into doing this line of work, I worked on a placebo uh, versus drug trial early on. 
uh, and I had a couple of these experiences where the patient at the end of the 11th session, you know, uh, you know, I would break the blind and I was 100% sure I'd had a drug responder in front of me and the patient would say, and it would say placebo. And I said to the guy, wow, you got a lot better. And he said, well, that's good. I said, but you were on the placebo. And he said, that's great, doc. Uh, I said, well, I, I just, well, so how did you do it? And he, he basically said, he said, look, I'm over there in Yakima. I have to drive over here once a week to see you. That means I have to take Friday off from my job. I hate my job. I'm 63 years old. I can't afford to retire. You know, uh, it's fall. It's beautiful. I drive across the mountains. You know, uh, we had a very attractive research assistant, and I forget her name now. She said, this lady spends a half hour with me. She asks me these questions about depression. I think to myself about, do I have this? Do I have that? Uh, then you're not half bad either, you know, even though I was just giving him placebo pills every day. And he said, if I do that 11 weeks in a row, that's a huge effect. It's true. And so I think a lot of what we packaged into our care management are those kinds of parts of treatment. But the truth is, if that person had gone to his PCP in Yakima, and the PCP had written him a script for 40 milligrams of Paxil and say, come see me in four weeks, what do you think the likelihood is he'd have gotten a lot better? Right? So I think there's a lot we can learn uh, about systematizing you know, some of those interventions and making sure they get delivered in a good way. Thank you so much. This is a really exciting for me because I've been slogging out in the field forever. And uh, uh, I really, we're, we're trying to incorporate some of your approach in novels. Yep. Uh, and the, I don't think the docs get it uh, because they're complaining about having to be in cubicles. And, yes. Uh, I mean, it's, that's not what, what our point is. And I'd love to bring you out to Toledo. Happy to. Uh, it's funny, I'm a little bit involved, right, with the Navos project, and I said, look guys, you know, your offices aren't that beautiful, and the chance that you might interact with another provider and really do something that gets that patient better, you know, might be a little bit higher if you're kind of seeing each other more. Because if everybody is doing parallel play, and I do my thing, and this other person does their thing, and we never really talk very much, we might not amount to very much, right? Very good. Christos. For the people that have gotten better, do you have anything long, longer term of seeing in terms of whether the person continues to stay better or whether their overall long term utilization also stays in the lower end? I want to repeat the question. Yeah, for the people who get better, do we know how they look long term? Actually, we do know that. Uh, we have, from the impact study, we everybody got 12 months of intervention. We went back a year later and looked at those people again, and we still see much higher. Uh, uh, emotional functioning, physical functioning, job-related functioning in the people who had seen the intervention. I worked before the impact trial uh, with a couple of guys at UCLA on a big study called the Depression Port Study, where we put mental health interventions into 46 primary care clinics, and we actually did a five-year and a ten-year follow-up. And even five and ten years out, the people who had had a year's worth of this kind of integrated care had better uh, occupational functioning. They actually even had higher household incomes. Uh, which was very interesting. Uh, so if you give a person a decent quality uh, treatment for depression, you know, at the right point in their life, it can have some pretty long-term effects. We should probably stop there. I think you're going to have a few minutes. Thank you so much. And I'm here, so if you have other questions, just find me.